Hello everyone, in today's video I'm going to be showing the complete assembly process of the new fully FDM 3D printable FFR SC1 chassis for Revell's 125th scale 2010 Ford Mustang model kits. I've showcased this chassis on a few occasions over on our social media pages and blog, and I'm very excited to finally be able to share it with all of you. For those who are unaware, this new FFR SC1 chassis variant features not only the pre-existing easy to print chassis pieces, but also an easy to print modular front suspension and steering assembly, and modified MA10 rear axle housing pieces. The idea for this chassis is the same as the FPUC1 that was released a few months ago, where you can simply download the files and print all the parts yourself. All the non-printable parts and hardware can be ordered from us in a convenient kit, along with certain electronics and tires. If you don't have your own printer or are having trouble printing certain parts, we'll be offering already printed parts and kits on our website. The chassis in a way is sort of in between the very basic FPUC1 and the slightly more scale FFR SC1 variants that we currently offer. Although the front suspension assembly and rear axle housing on this chassis might not be as scale as some of the components for sale on our site, not only are these easy to print on a typical hobby grade FDM printer, but are also more durable and in the case of the front suspension, much easier to assemble, so keep that in mind. All the parts are designed to fit specific Revell 2010 Mustang model kits, so there's no measuring required. More of these chassis sized to fit different kits are in the works. So with that said, let's get started. The first step is to print all the parts. There are quite a few parts in total that you'll need to print, including some parts such as the wheels that you'll need to print more than one of. You'll want to make sure you've got your print settings dialed in and ensure your parts are adhering well to the bed. Be sure to check the dimensional accuracy of the parts as well to ensure each piece of the chassis fits together without issues. I sometimes get asked what print settings I recommend using. It's hard for me to say what print settings to use, since what might work well for the printer I'm using might not be the optimal settings for your printer. Because of this, I highly recommend experimenting with different settings and getting on some groups or forums specific to the printer you're using to learn more from others using the same printer as you. There are also some great troubleshooting guides available online if you encounter any issues with print quality. Most of the parts I printed using a 0.15mm layer height, I also reduced the layer width when printing some of the tiniest parts and make sure every part is securely attached to the bed with no warping. At some point, I do want to make a few tiny modifications to the design, such as modifying the opening on the steering center link ends to be a teardrop shape instead of a perfect circle to avoid the flat top that you see here.
While some of the parts were being printed, I moved over to the bench to have a look at the Revell 125th scale 2010 Ford Shelby GT500 model kit. This is an all-around great looking kit with a lot of detail and well-molded parts. Although not all the parts in this kit will be used, I wanted to take a moment to show you everything that's included. I really like the variety of decals and the inclusion of both silver and white stripes. The most important part, being the body, looks great. Again, lots of detail, and the proportions and shape look spot on comparing it to the real car. I like the Cobra emblems being separate from the body, which will make them easy to paint. I'll be diving into this kit a lot more in the next video where I build the body and complete the car. With all the parts successfully printed, I was ready to move on to building the chassis. As I said earlier, kits with hardware and non-printable parts will be available on our site. This hardware kit includes all the parts needed to assemble the chassis. Be sure not to mix the hardware together or remove the hardware from the bags before you're ready to use it. Here's a quick look at some of the tools I'll be using to assemble the chassis. Some of the most important tools to have are good screwdrivers that fit well into each screw head. This will prevent the heads from becoming stripped, which isn't hard to do on some of the tiny hardware. A small hobby drill is also a great tool for enlarging holes to make threading the screws in much easier. We'll start by assembling the rear axle. Make sure you thoroughly inspect each axle housing piece to ensure there are no defects that might cause the axle to not rotate smoothly. I cleaned up the bottom edge around where the ring gear will be placed so I don't have to worry about the ring gear rubbing against this edge.
I next laid out all the parts that I'll be using, including the M2 threaded axle shaft and wheel mounts. I'll be using the thicker 4x2mm wheel mounts for this build. I also got out the gears, drive shaft socket, and four bearings. Just like when assembling any other MA-10 with a solid M2 threaded axle shaft, I first install the bearings for the pinion gear and then slide the pinion gear shaft through the center of each bearing. Make sure the pinion gear can rotate smoothly and there's not too much play. Next place the drive shaft socket onto the pinion gear shaft. Make sure the hole on the drive shaft socket and pinion gear shaft are aligned before threading in the screw to prevent the pinion gear shaft from being damaged. I like to use a pin to make sure the holes are aligned. I then carefully insert the screw. There is just a little play on my axle between the bearing and the axle housing. Although any sort of play is undesirable, the small amount I have here shouldn't be a problem. Here is how the axle should look so far. Next glue the ring gear to the center of the axle shaft. Make sure there is an equal amount of the axle sticking out on each side. I used some super glue to secure the ring gear to the axle. A stronger glue made specifically for bonding to metal would be ideal, but I've had a lot of success with using basic super glue. Once the glue for the ring gear is dry, I placed a bearing and then threaded a wheel mount onto each side of the axle as shown. I then placed the axle onto the housing and tightened the wheel mounts until the ring gear was properly aligned and rotated smoothly. Make sure the ring gear is correctly positioned in the housing you'll see a cutout on the side the ring gear should be placed on. I verify that the axle can rotate smoothly before gluing each wheel mount into place. Before I secure each half of the axle housing together, I apply some of the included grease to the gears. To secure the two axle halves together, use the black 1x5 screws and 1x3 screws. The longer 1x5 screws are for the four holes in the center, and the shorter 1x3 screws are for the holes on the outside. After verifying that the axle can rotate smoothly, the axle assembly is now complete, and we can move on to the next step. Now we can install the lower trailing arms using 1.6x8 machine screws. I used a 1.6mm drill bit to ensure the holes on the lower trailing arms are large enough so they don't fit too snug, which would cause the axle to not be able to move as much or as easily as I'd like. To 
To secure the resin upper control arm, use a silver 1x5 machine screw. The control arm is included with the kit. Be sure to orient it correctly before installing. To secure the panhard bar to the axle, use a 1.6x5 machine screw. Again, be sure to orient the panhard bar correctly. Here's how the axle should look so far. Next, secure the overaxle piece to the main chassis piece. Use two 2x5 two machine screws. After making sure each part is securely attached with no play between them, I connect the other side of the lower trailing arms to the chassis using 1.6x6 machine screws. Use a silver 1x5 machine screw to secure the upper control arm to the chassis. At this point, it's a good idea to verify that the rear suspension can move smoothly. I needed to sand down the panhard bar some for it to fit the chassis, which I did and then secured it to the chassis using a 1.6x5 machine screw. The axle and all rear suspension links are now installed, so I moved on to mounting the rear chassis piece. Here I'm drilling out these holes to make threading in the screws easier. Before mounting the rear chassis piece, I installed the rear trunk pan piece using four 1x3 screws. To secure the rear piece to the rest of the chassis, use three 1.2x5 screws. Here's how the rear of the chassis should look so far. Next, secure the motor mount to the chassis using two 1.6x5 machine screws. Be sure to place the screws in the same holes as I do so that the motor will be positioned correctly.
With the motor mount in place, I now want to cut the 2mm steel rod to the correct length for the drive shaft. Find the bag with the drive shaft ends and the socket for the N20 motor. I temporarily placed the motor where it will be mounted and then marked where I needed to make the cut. I then test fit the drive shaft and adjusted it as needed. I found that about 61 to 62 millimeters was the perfect length for this chassis. You need to make sure the drive shaft is long enough to not fall out, but not too long so the rear suspension can move without any binding. Ideally, there should be just a little play when moving the drive shaft forward and back. With the size correct, I glued the drive shaft ends onto each side of the rod. I removed the motor mount to make it easier to secure the motor to the mount. Use 1.6 by 6 machine screws to secure the motor to the mount. I put some grease on each end of the drive shaft and then reinstalled the motor mount back on the chassis, this time with the drive shaft in place. Here's how the chassis should look so far. We can now move on to building the front suspension assembly. Starting with the base piece, you'll need to cut a small section of 2mm tube that will be glued to the base piece. I cut a section of the tube a little over 3mm long. I then glued the tube to the center of the base piece. This tube is what the steering center link will slide through. While waiting for the glue to dry, I assembled the steering knuckles. I started by placing the bearings on the front and back of each knuckle as shown. Next, place the M2 machine screws through the bearings, just like I did here. Make sure the threaded end is pointing out on the correct side of the knuckle. After that, thread on a 4x2 wheel mount onto each axle using glue to secure it in place. You don't want to make it too tight, but also not too loose, allowing a lot of play in the axle. Here 
Here's how the knuckles should look so far. These bearings need to be able to freely slide up and down on the knuckle. To ensure they can do this, I do any necessary sanding to the top and bottom of the knuckle so the bearings can slide up and down without any resistance. Once that is complete, secure a 1.6x10 machine screw onto each knuckle. These are what the tie rods will connect to. Be sure they are oriented correctly as shown. These screws should be secure and not have any play. To ensure they won't move, I apply some glue to the top of each. While waiting for the glue to dry, I secure these pieces that connect the upper and lower sections of the front suspension assembly. Use the 1.6x5 machine screws to secure these parts. After that, I glued each tie rod half together, making sure each half was correctly aligned. Once the glue is dried, thread a 1.6x8 machine screw into one end of each tie rod. Just like the knuckle earlier, I glued the top end of each to the tie rod. Once the glue is dry, you'll need both the M1.6 nut and O-rings bag. Place one of the large O-rings onto the knuckle steering arm, then slide on the tie rod, and then another large O-ring. Place a nut on the end to prevent the O-rings and tie rod from falling off. This is how the knuckle should look so far. Repeat the same process for the other side. Next we'll install the steering center link ends onto the opposite side of each tie rod. Place two of the medium size O-rings onto the shaft and then the center link end followed by two more medium O-rings and a M1.6 nut. They should look like this. The knuckles are now ready to be installed.
Pick which spring you'd like to use and then cut each to the same length. Different springs and different spring lengths will change how soft or hard the front suspension is. Feel free to experiment with this. For this build, I chose the 0.2mm wire soft springs to use in the front. To make assembling the front suspension easier, I like to use a little glue to secure the bearings to the upper piece. Of course, just make sure not to get glue inside the bearing, which will prevent it from rotating. Use four 1.6 by 5 machine screws to secure the top piece. Make sure the knuckles can easily slide up and down and turn without any resistance. Also make sure there isn't any undesirable play. This is how the assembly should look so far. I now need to determine how long I want to make the center link. I take a rough measurement and then cut a section of 1.5 millimeter steel rod to that length. From there, I gradually grind it down until it is the length that I want. The length of the center link is what sets the toe angle for the front wheels. I usually like to have the front wheels toe in slightly, but there are advantages and disadvantages to different toe angles. The most important thing is to frequently test fit the rod and ensure you don't remove too much material. Simply glue the 3D printed ends to the rod once it's the length that you want. One thing to keep in mind is due to the narrow width of this particular front end assembly, the steering angle is relatively limited. This is so the assembly will fit under the body with relatively wide front tires. Secure the front suspension assembly to the chassis using four 1.6 by 5 machine screws. To prevent any of the nuts used for the front suspension from coming loose, I use blue Loctite. While waiting for the Loctite to dry, we can assemble the wheels. The wheels are two separate parts to make them easy to print and easy to paint if you decide to make the outer rim and the center different colors. At a later time, I'll be painting and gluing the two parts of the wheels together. However, for now, I already had a set of wheels to use. Moving back over to the chassis, get the bag with the steering servo and the bag with the black servo arm. We won't use any of the white arms included with the servo for this project. However, we will need the screw that threads into the servo, which you can see here. Press the servo arm onto the servo and then install the screw. After that, find the two servo mounts. 
Use the 1.6x4 screws to secure the servo to the chassis. With the servo now securely mounted to the chassis, I got the steering arm that I printed earlier and threaded a 1x6 machine screw into the outer hole, making sure the direction is correct, as you can see here. The threaded end should be on the flat side of the arm. I again use glue to ensure it will stay in place. After that dries, press fit it onto the top of the knuckle as shown. Place one of the small O-rings onto the shaft then the steering servo link end, then another small O-ring, and finally a M1 nut. I measured the distance between the two servo link ends and cut a section of 1.5 millimeter rod to that length, which was around 23 millimeters. Once it's the correct length, glue each rod end to it. I also once again added some Loctite to the M1 nut. For the rear axle, I chose harder 0.3mm springs. I cut them to the length I wanted and then placed them between the axle and chassis. Once the weight of the electronics and body are added, I'll probably adjust the length some. Finally, use the M2 nuts to secure each wheel. The front wheels can roll freely and the suspension feels good as well. By design, the track width in the front is narrower than in the rear. This is to ensure there will be plenty of room for the front wheels to steer, even if the bodies drop down to give the car a lowered stance. If you don't want the front wheels to be further in, use the thinner 4x1 wheel mounts as spacers on each front wheel to push them out. One thing I still wanted to do was cut away the excess axle in the front. Although it's best to do this before you completely assemble the chassis, I carefully did this using a rotary tool.
Here's a look at the finished chassis. At this point, it's ready for electronics and the body to be mounted. I'll be covering all of that in the next video where I finish this build and test drive it. If you'd like to build one of these chassis, the STL files are available to all Maker tier patrons on Patreon. The link will be below in the description. If you don't have your own printer, all the parts will be available for sale on our store page along with all the non-printable parts. These kits with already printed parts are not yet available at the time of uploading this video, however they will be released soon. The links for those will also be in the description. I hope this video was helpful to everyone building one of these chassis. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I'll do my best to answer them. However, the best way to get an answer would be through either email or a private message on Patreon, especially if you're watching this months after its original upload date. A big thanks for everyone's patience, as I know there's been a lot of people eagerly awaiting for this chassis release. There's more variants of this chassis coming soon, along with some other cool 3D printable RC stuff that hasn't yet been shown publicly, but I think many of you are really going to like, so be sure to be on the lookout for that. Finally, I thought I'd take a moment to invite anyone who's interested to follow Make It RC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as turn on notifications. Although I haven't been able to post as much lately, I try to regularly update followers on RC projects you see here on the channel, as well as new product releases, blog posts, and other relevant updates. If time will finally permit, going into the new year, I want to try to get into the habit of posting more updates and photos, as well as experiment with creating shorter videos different from the long form ones that I upload here on this channel. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, you'll find those social media links in the description. But that's all for this video, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.